The North Korean state news agency has just released what it calls the text of the Russia DPRK Comprehensive Strategic Partnership Treaty that Vladimir Putin and Kim Jong-un signed this week in Pyongyang. They even released this text in English, which together with what we know from the press conference and from the developments in North Korea earlier this year, allow us to draw some interesting conclusions. Most of all, that this is probably the largest change in North Korean foreign policy of the last decades, if not half a century. So let's have a look together. First of all, I need to emphasize that although the Russian um, state news agency TASS has pointed out that this is the release of the text of the Strategic Partnership Treaty, when we actually go to the DPRK homepage, uh, state um, government uh, news agency homepage, uh, the, this is not precisely the, the, the text of the treaty. This is a report about what is in the treaty. Um, and so although this is the most that we have at the moment, I caution you that until and unless we actually have the full treaty with the signatures, um, or a, a copy thereof in front of us, we cannot be sure that this is everything. So um, this is a word of caution, but this is the closest thing we have, especially because this is coming from the uh, official North Korean side. Um, so we should use it for analysis, but um, analysis with, with this caveat that maybe there's something that they didn't report here. Because, you know, the, uh, the text starts with, according to the treaty, the two sides. So this is not the treaty itself. This is a text about the treaty. So that's, that's relevant. But let's go and look at what, what, the, what this report, this official North Korean report about the treaty itself is. And it goes into, into many, many details. It's quite long. And I, I want to take the time to look at this with you and then um, contrast it with what we know from uh, earlier uh, um, meetings, um, earlier pronouncements, especially by Kim Jong-un. So I highlighted the things that I believe are most essential um, to, especially for the security relationship, to understand what this treaty is about. The two sides shall aspire to global strategic stability and establishment of a new fair and equal international order. And supposing that this is actually the wording of the, of the treaty itself, it suggests that this is the beginning of the of really um, North Korea's breakout of this uh, stranglehold that the, uh, the UN and under, under US leadership had on it and that this is basically a sign for North Korea saying like no we are now going to integrate into the rest of the, of the, the, global, the global community and um, things will be different. Um, now the, the treaty seems to go relatively quickly into the question of security, right? So it says that in case of any, in case any one of the two sides is put in a state of war by an armed invasion from an individual state or several states, the other side shall provide military and other assistance with all means in its possession without delay in accordance with Article 51 of the UN Charter and the laws of the DPRK and the Russian Federation. This is highly interesting. Um, of course, this, a single state could be South, uh, South Korea, a coalition of states could be a US coalition around it. And, and the, the, the idea here is that the other state, that Russia in that case, would immediately um, send support. And I find it, again, fascinating that it mentions Article 51 of the UN Charter, which is an emphasis on, on, on the legality and the, the rightfulness of this, of this entire agreement. This is, of course, Article 51 is the self-defense article and collective self-defense article, um, the, the very same one which uh, NATO at the moment uses in order to justify sending weapons to Ukraine. Um, everybody uses Article 51 to say, like, we, we do what we do, our alliance systems, in accordance with the UN Charter. So also the North Koreans uh, and Russians are saying what we are doing here is in accordance with the UN Charter. So nobody rejects the UN Charter. Nobody rejects, actually, the, the UN as a framework. They, uh, they, everybody uh, accepts that one as a, as a basic premise. Um, it, interestingly, as I said in another program, uh, it doesn't specify what this assistance would mean. Military and other assistance, you know, it doesn't specify whether this means um, boots on the ground, whether it means it, that there will be a direct involvement of the, of the other military um, 
other than sending weapons, for instance. I mean, again, this this itself doesn't mean that if North Korea was attacked, that Russia automatically would send troops and would, would fight collectively uh, back. But it might mean that um, Russia will, will provide to North Korea what the NATO is currently providing to Ukraine. That is cons completely, utterly uh, within the scope of what uh, this wording here suggests. Um, the next, the next paragraph then says that each side is obliged not to conclude with any third country any agreement uh, encroaching upon the other side's sovereignty, security, territorial inviolability um, or rights to freely opt for and develop political, social, economic and cultural systems and other core interests not to take part in such actions. This is also highly fascinating um, because it is very close to a clause that was in a treaty between Japan and the Soviet Union um, back in 1941. Um, basically a, um, a non-aggression principle um, of the two sides that they would not, uh, that, that they would, would, um, would actually, if, if a third party started to uh, um, uh, to be aggressive towards any of the two states, then the other one will not will not participate in that, which is basically it's basically a neutrality uh, and a based on basic understanding of neutrality in case in case a third state with which either of the two has a good relationship would want to to encroach upon upon the other one. Um, so this is just a lock to say that these two, two states, DPRK and Russia, will remain friendly to each other, even in conflicts, even if one of the two has a conflict with a third state, that this one doesn't really want to join. Which is, which is fascinating. It's actually a, new, a kind of a, new, it's a neutrality clause in this, um, in, in this agreement. The two sides, with the aim of maintaining international peace and security, shall discuss and cooperate with each other in the matters concerning the global and regional developments that could be a direct or indirect challenge to their common interests and security within the framework of international bodies, including the UN and its specialized organs. This is also highly relevant because it basically means that Russia now officially, according to this treaty, gets a say in what is going to happen on the Korean Peninsula. Again, read this. Um, with the, the two sides shall discuss and cooperate with each other in matters concerning the global and regional development that could be direct or indirect challenge to their common interests. And since Russia now clearly has interests in this uh, in this uh, far eastern region and um, the, the the southern part of it, uh, this basically means that anything that would happen toward South Korea is now also a matter of the Russians, <laughs> and officially. It used to be only a matter of the Chinese because um, China had this and still has a, a similar mutual defense defense pact with uh, North Korea. But now we have the official agreement that the Russians are party to the to the regional security of the Korean Peninsula. And the next paragraph then says the two sides shall provide mechanisms for taking joint measures with the aim of strengthening the defense capabilities for preventing war and ensuring regional and global peace and security. This this is actually a very hopeful article to me um, that preventing war is actually a goal of their cooperation and um, you cannot act unilaterally basically when it comes to South Korea. This is North Korea promising that anything that happens toward the South will be coordinated with Russia or will not happen against uh, Russia's will. Um, and this, I, I think this is really the core. This is the core of the security arrangement. And, and the core is now we have basically a trilateral situation with uh, Russia, China and North Korea basically saying we will coordinate together and, and we will try to maintain peace and stability. And this is very important when we look at what Kim Jong-un said earlier this year and how they revised their security strategy. Um, just let's look at the rest of this treaty. We then have a long, uh, many passages, which we don't need to read in detail, that tr uh, talk about increasing trade between the partners, uh, creating a special economic zone between the DPRK and the Russian Federation. So cooperation across the border for, for economic purposes, maybe um, some, uh, I mean, a special economic zone means usually a part that is not, uh, has special tax provisions and special legal provisions that then allow for joint development, joint manufacturing and so on. So this will be now apparently created at this borderland between Russia and 
and North Korea. Um, then they want to do exchange and cooperations in the field of technology. Um, and they want to establish direct tries between the DPRK and Russian Federation to promote mutual understanding and economic investment uh, cooperation and cooperation in the fields of agriculture, education, public health, sports, culture, tourism. They want to increase tourism between the two countries. I mean, this is a huge change for North Korea, which doesn't really like foreigners and used not to like foreigners inside its borders, uh, nor it's the Koreans to go and uh, North Koreans to go out. And this seems to be changing. And it isn't changing towards the West, it's changing towards Russia. And maybe China to follow um, can't can really tell at the moment. But this is a this is a big change um, in, in what North how North Korea used to, to structure its internal affairs. The two sides shall oppose the application of unilateral compulsory, compulsory measures, aka sanctions. They will oppose sanctions against each other. They so uh, Russia officially promising that it will not support any more kind of sanctioning of North Korea, which will change the whole UN uh, sanction system on North Korea. Again, a huge blow, like uh, freeing um, North Korea's um, economic potential. Uh, certainly, and then the cooperation again, um, combating illegal uh, illegal activities and cooperation in the field of information security, and also important, uh, the treaty shall be uh, indefinitely in effect. So this is not something that you need to renew. This is something that if you want to stop it, you need to actively stop. Uh, uh, um, send a letter saying like we are we are uh, uh, we are hereby uh, exiting this agreement. Otherwise, this agreement is just gonna. Gonna, gonna continue to live between these two states. So, and this is ex especially important, uh, the, uh, this entire thing, because Vladimir Putin at the press conference in first in Pyongyang and then in Hanoi, I think in Hanoi he answered questions about this one. And he said that there's nothing new in this treaty. This treaty is just an update of an older treaty between the Soviet Union and uh, and and the DPRK which expired but it, it basically it's it's just an update he said just an update but now I uh, uh, let's do this I mean if this is just an update then let's look at the older version because the older version we have access to we have access to the actual text in English of, of that version and the first thing you see is that this version the older one is much shorter. I mean, this is just a preamble. The preamble is just the the, the additional uh, the, the 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 salad on the side um, where they where they define kind of why they do this. But then the actual treaty itself is really just six articles, um, and that's it, one page. Whereas this one here seems to be really really extensive, and especially the economic part here. Um, which covers a lot of uh, a lot of ground is is quite short in is is contained in only one article in the older Soviet in the older Soviet ver version to de develop strength and economic cultural ties between the the two states. So one little article, and here we have quite precise you know um, uh, uh, areas in which cooperation should happen, including a, uh, a special economic zone between the two. Right. Um, the interesting thing is where they where they what what's the update of the security parts, right? Because that's what Vladimir Putin was talking about. Let's read the old one. So the old the old treaty says that. Let me make this a bit bigger. Should either of the contracting parties suffer armed attack by any state or a coalition of states and thus find itself in a state of war, the other contracting party shall immediately extend military and other assistance with all the means at its disposal. So this is pretty similar to what we've got in the new treaty, right? Uh, and basically the same. Just that the new treaty is a little bit more vague. Here, this, this treaty says, with all means at its disposal, um, although, well, no, it's, it's more or less the same. It's the same. It's the same. Um, it doesn't really define what that assistance means, so it's the same. Article 2, then, is each contracting party undertakes not to enter into any alliance or any participation in a coalition or in any action or, or measure directed against the other contracting party. That's, again, basically a neutrality clause that, in case of a third, uh, of a third state uh, doing something unfriendly, then the, the contracting party will not join this one. Um, even if it has a good relationship with uh, with those third states, um, you know, you could think about China. This is probably geared toward China, right? If ever China became hostile to the DPRK, the promise here is, or to Russia, the promise is that the DPRK would not chi uh, join China against Russia, and the uh, um, Russia will not join China against the DPRK. In in that hypothetical scenario where China becomes an enemy of the DPRK, the other one will remain neutral. 
that's that's what the I, I think that's that's how I interpret this this sentence because the China is really the only the only thing um, uh, the only power in this constellation that you could think about because Japan is already in the camp of the other one although it could it could also extend to Japan if Japanese um, uh, uh, ties with Russia and, and China like uh, warmed up um, in fact. But main, mainly this, this concerns China. Same, same of course, here. The, the, of course, this article is geared toward what happens if there's a bad relationship with this third state that at the, at the current moment is a good relationship. Now, third article, the contracting parties shall consult together on all important and international questions involving the interests of both states in effort to strengthen peace and, and universal security. This is a shorter version of what we have in the new, in the, in, in the new document, which is a bit longer in terms of like security measures. But then, then my friends, I would like to uh, attract your attention to this article, article number five in the old treaty. There's a article five says, the two contracting parties consider that the unification of Korea should be brought about on a peaceful and democratic basis. And that such a solution is in keeping both with the national interests of the Korean people and with the cause of maintaining peace in the Far East. This article does not exist anymore. In the new in the new treaty, the the article on reunification with South Korea is gone. It just doesn't appear anymore. If you have an article on keeping peace and security, and keeping peace in the region, and keeping and 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 consulting with each other in in matters of peace and security, but what you do not have anymore is the is the the goal, the aim of reunification with uh, South Korea. Now this is a big one. This is a really big one because it basically lays out that North Korea uh, is now also in its international treaties working, not working anymore on, uh, on, on, join, on joining the South or rejoining these two states. What we are seeing is that the North Koreans seem to now work toward a two-state solution. They, for the longest time, in all of their textbooks and in all of their speeches and in all of their, their, their um, public, public acts, always said that um, Pyongyang is the capital of all of Korea, but there's permanently an illegal, an illegal uh, uh, entity in the South that occupies it. And we are trying to, to get that back. But you know, um, uh, Pyongyang, the DPRK is the entirety of the peninsula. And they see they are now moving away from that very quickly. And this is actually not new. And for anyone who paid attention to what happened earlier this year, there was um, a big announcement, it was even featured in, in, the, in the West in news that North Korea's Kim Jong-un abandons uh, unification goal with the South. Um, and it was a reported a bit in the sense that the North is not, um, does not want peaceful reunification anymore, which was actually a goal of the North Koreans. Peaceful reunification was part of their, uh, uh, of, of their setup and all of their policy papers. I'm not sure if it was in their constitution or not, but it's in the policy papers that they want a peaceful uh, reunification. And they dropped that entirely. And in a lot of Western media, it was reported, oh, the Kim Jong-un doesn't want to um, uh, unify anymore peacefully. But if we read, again, the actual text of what was said, in uh, what 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 uh, he said, Kim Jong Un at this um, at this meeting in Pyongyang on January sixteenth, so about uh, almost half a year ago, uh, we we find very very interesting insights. Right, uh, quite it was a long speech, and uh, way far down here, the the interesting um, part starts, um, in which like he lays out that this peaceful unification has obviously failed. So we need to move on. Um, the text in, in his speech, he said that it is the final conclusion drawn from the bitter history of the inter-Korean relations that we cannot go along the road of national restoration and reunification together with the Republic of Korea. No, that's South Korea, right? Um, the clan that adapted um, as its state policy the all-out confrontation with the Republic, dreaming of collapse of our government and unification by absorption. And you know, this is this is actually this is true. I mean, a, a lot of the thinking about reunification from the southern side and from the Americans and, 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 and Western allies is of course that uh, in, in, in Korea the same thing should have uh, should happen as what happened in Germany and in Germany East Germany and West Germany they didn't they didn't unite this was not a merger it was a it was a hostile takeover right it was the Federal Republic that sucked up the GDR and the GDR the, the German Democratic Republic ceased to exist just went away like poof gone 
the, the whole the whole uh, structure of the GDR gone. And th this has been very official that this was basically the goal of reunification, reunification under the Republic of Korea, right? That should take over the DPRK. And uh, Kim Jong Un says, like, guys, this is not what this is not what we what we could agree to. And um, the fact that this is one of your goals is something that we cannot live with. And um, we are not we are just not going to have that. Which is under, which is totally utterly understandable from the DPRK and from Kim Jong Un's position, right? Um, the, the the text goes on with that, or uh, Kim Jong Un also said that the North South relations have been completely fixed into the relationship between the two states, hostile to each other, and the relations between the two belligerent states, not the co uh, consanguineous or homogeneous ones anymore. So, and then he uses this explanation to justify that now we have to change our policy. We have formulated a new stand on the North-South relations and the policy of uh, reunification and dismantle, uh, dismantled all the organizations we established as solidarity bodies for peaceful reunification at the current session of the Supreme People's Assembly, which discusses the laws of the DPRK. Um, so they actually, they actually stopped all of the reunification uh, bodies that they had going on with, with the South. Um, as the southern border of... Uh, the interesting thing now, though, is that he clearly says that we, well, the North needs to move on. The southern border of our country has been clearly drawn. We know where our southern border is, is what he's saying. And the southern border is then, of course, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the demarcation line between North and South, where the armistice is happening. Um, the one thing that North Korea has been saying, it, it doesn't really accept. Um, it, it lays claims to the entire Korean peninsula. But now that he says that the southern border has, has been clearly drawn, um, you know, the southern border of the peninsula is, of course, where the ocean starts in the south. Um, and that's not a drawn line. The drawn line is the demarcation line. Uh, along the 38th parallel. So he, he says like, okay, we that's our southern border. Let's accept it. This is our state. Um, he then says the illegal northern limit line and any other boundary can never be tolerated. What he means with that one is actually the sea border. So there is um, there is the official, the, the de facto sea border between the two states is this northern limit, limit line or demarcation line, which uh, actually here cuts off even um, some, some islands. And apparently this is what he's unhappy with. This is something that he still disputes and where we will probably see um, contestations in the future. It's, but it's maritime. This is a maritime border, not the land border. The land border, he's saying, is, is pretty clear. Um, and if the ROK violates even 0.001 millimeter of our territorial land and air waters, it will be considered a war of provocation. It's like, okay, okay, so they don't stop the, bellig the belligerent language, but basically he's saying, okay, we will know where the border is. As long as you don't try to take anything away, we'll be fine. Uh, and then it's interesting. He goes on, Kim Jong-un goes on. Recently, I studied the constitutions of some other countries and found that they, are, they clearly stipulate the political and geographical definition of the territory parts in which the sovereign state uh, is sovereignty is exercised. The territorial land and territorial waters and territorial airspace space in other words. There is no provision um, spe specifying such definition in the existing constitution of our country. Since our republic defini um, definitely defined the ROK as a foreign country and the most hostile state after uh, completely eliminating the original concept of con uh, contradictory or reality that the ROK is the partner of the reconciliation and reunification and the fellow countrymen, it is necessary to take legal steps to legitimately and correctly define the territorial sphere where the sovereignty of the DPRK as an independent socialist nation is exercised. And then he goes on and says, like, yeah, we should do that. We have to define our, our borders, our North Korean borders, uh, the way we are. And then, and then that's it. And then we will, we will defend that. So North Korea opts for a two-state solution. This is it. There, there's, no more, there's no more we want to reunify. Um, and there's another couple of passages which were really um, highly fascinating in that speech. I reaffirm that the strongest absolute strength we are cultivating is not a means to a preemptive attack for realizing unilateral unification by force of arms. Again, he's saying what they're doing is for self-defense. What they're doing is not intended to create unilateral unification by force of arms. But the capabilities for legitimate self-defense um, pertaining to our right to self-defense, which should be bolstered up without fail, definitely to defend ourselves. Um, he's he's actually affirming uh, North Korea is not is, does not want to 
create unilateral change in the north in the north south uh, uh, divide in we the north koreans we have our we have our country that's it we will continue and that is that is what they put into an international treaty with the russians now even giving the russians a say in any kind of security development in north in north south relations they they, they put that into writing um, explicitly speaking we will never unilaterally unleash a war if the enemy does not provoke us the enemy should never misjudge this as our weakness. So I mean, this is this is this is pretty huge. And then he says we're still willing to fight. I mean, if you if you provoke us or if you try to take away anything from us, uh, we do not want war, but also have no intention of avoiding it. I mean, he's clearly bellicose. Clearly, we are ready to fight. We're ready to fight, but we will not do this as a means of re for reunification. And again, we now have the Russians also as having a say in what's happening there. So this is this is pretty huge to me. Um, this is going to be the unleashing of or the, the unchaining. This is the unchaining, self unchaining of North Korea, because on the one hand, they now have partners, including Russia, and who knows, maybe become a member of BRICS. Um, they, they, they have new friends and they actually took away their own restraints. The restraint was that they always wanted this reunification at all and any cost. And it seems now the reunification bit is a nice to have, but definitely not, not a goal anymore. Uh, North Korea will continue as North Korea and it just reserves the right to exist the way that it is and will, will, will develop. So um, I don't know if this is good news or, or not. It seems to me that this is rather something that if it is meant, if it's meant seriously, especially also from the Russian side, that you wouldn't use North Korea as a way to weaken the U.S. with a proxy war, then this is a very positive development because it's actually it, it would strengthen the, the the stability in the in the North because it we now officially have more players involved that all commit to the UN Charter and to uh, to peace and stability and they're saying like peace and stability is the goal not reunification and not a, a, a one-sided version version of justice and the, the the russians and the chinese are having now both a say in what's going to happen and they they seem to support at least the russians the idea of okay north korea is north korea and we now create a de jure a de jure situation the one thing missing is of course a peace treaty north and south korea haven't signed a peace treaty yet and the question is what will south korea do um, how will it approach this new situation with, uh, with the North? Um, this remains to be seen, but to me, we are moving towards a de jure to Korean states. And who knows whether that might be the way to peace eventually and to, to exchange between the two at the end of the day, whether you're two states or one state, as long if people can travel and if people can be can be free and happy and live prosperously, then that's all you need, even if you have two governments. I mean, why not? Why not? We'll see. Um, very big takeaway, very big takeaway. Reunification is gone. Two-state solution seems to be the way the North Koreans want to take it. Unchaining. Expect to see more of North Korea uh, in the very near future uh, economically. This is, uh, this is a new chapter on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you.